Christ first came, it was to make us ready for when he will come again. Advent. Advent is about anticipation. His first coming makes us long for his second coming. When he first came, it was as a vulnerable little baby born in a stable. But when he comes again, it will be as a glorious one coming in the clouds and all the earth will see him. When he first came, it was as a servant to give his life as a ransom. But when he comes again, it will be as a king who will rule the whole earth and reign forevermore. When Jesus first came, only a few lonely shepherds, outcasts, came to worship him. But when he returns, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him, Jesus, as King of kings and Lord of lords. So eagerly we wait for the second Christmas. So now let's turn to the message. And so we're in this series. It's a short series, just uh, four messages long. It's an Advent series, uh, and it's called Waiting for Christmas, except it's Waiting for Second Christmas. And the intro does a great job of um, what this series is all about and really what the message of Christmas from the Bible is all about. And that is there is this incredible contrast between the first coming of Jesus and his second. Do you know from the Old Testament, it was not clear to those in Jesus' day, listen to this, that there would be two advents, that there would be two arrivals of Jesus. It, it wasn't clear, and you can understand why. For instance, there were prophecies uh, that would say that, that he was like the one I just read earlier, that, that when he comes, he'll be wonderful counselor and almighty God and prince of peace, and, and the government will be on his shoulders. And, and then the day of vengeance, uh, he will also bring the day of vengeance as well. Well, Jesus brought no day of vengeance when he came the first time. And so there are many prophecies just like that. It was hard for the people of Jesus' day to discern that his coming would be two comings. And so that created a sort of a challenge of, of recognizing when Christ would come. But it makes an incredible point. And that is that there is this huge contrast between his first coming and his second coming. And that actually creates, this is what the whole series is about, it creates a contrast about how you live your life and what you hope for. There's a huge contrast there. And that's what I want to stir in this series and in this message. Last time we said, we said Advent is about this, high expectancy that Christ could return. Now we turn to this. I want to show you this contrast, this first contrast. Look at it. It's, uh, it's this. Christ's first coming was highly expected, but missed, missed by most. His second coming will be unexpected, but impossible to miss. Now we're... We're going to carry that contrast through uh, this whole message. But I want, to, I want to explore that for just a second. His first coming, highly expected, but almost completely missed. Uh, there was a lot of anticipation for the coming of the Messiah in Jesus' day. There's some scholarship that shows that there were, within about 200 years of Jesus' life, there were 12 different individuals who rose up and said they were the Messiah of God's people. Most of them were like political, military sort of leaders, and each one of them evaporated, and everyone went home and waited for the next. And so... What the point of that is that in Jesus' day and his generation, there was high anticipation for the coming uh, of the Messiah. Um, and in fact, there were when Jesus came, there was an angelic announcement. Angels announced it. There was a star 
pointing at the little hamlet in which he was born. But who noticed? (laughs) Who noticed? There were some shepherd laborers in the middle of the night who saw it and they attended. Um, There were these, I guess we called, well, there were these magi, magi from Persia. uh, They noticed, you know that the translation for magi is that they were science and math nerds. Do Do you know that? That's what the magi were. They their, their math and astronomy told them to go there. And, and uh, there, was one, there was one paranoid local ruler named Herod that acknowledged his arrival. But beyond that, it was almost universally missed. It was highly expected, but missed. But his second coming will be completely different. And this is where we stir our affection as, as, as Christ followers because his second coming will be unexpected but impossible to miss. Jesus says that himself when he talks about that. He talks extensively about that in Matthew 24. And he says about his second coming, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will all see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with great power and glory. And so Jesus says additionally about his coming that it will be unexpected. He says, for this reason you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. And so his second coming will be completely different. It will be unexpected but impossible to miss. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5, the Apostle Paul says that everyone, everyone in the day that Jesus returns, everyone will be saying peace and safety, and then suddenly, like a thief in the night, Jesus will return. And so, and so the Bible says, though, there are these few, though, now listen to this, there are these few, though, who live in anticipation they live with expectancy constant expectancy that jesus will come and none of them wear tinfoil hats that's not the kind of few that we're talking about there are you with me there okay we'll we'll just let that one go by and um, (laughs) because the few the few are the ones whose lives have been genuinely sincerely authentically changed by him Jesus says that, uh, that, that those who live, the Bible says, the Bible says that those who live with true expectancy that Jesus will return, they're few in number, but they are, they are these, it's whose lives have been just like radically changed by him. They've turned away from, from their former life, the lives that pursued all the gods of their own making, all of the idols of their own, they've turned away from those you know, the ones that we make up, the ones that we, that we choose as substitutes like money and, or accomplishment or social status or, or maybe it's the status positions. It's the substitute gods that we pile around to our lives. We've turned, they've turned away from, from those and they have found life and they have found it in, they have found it in Christ's first coming, what he did on the cross. When he came as God wrapped in flesh and then going to the cross and dying in our place for us and when we put our faith in that, when we put our faith in Christ through the gospel, it changes everything and one of the things it changes is our expectancy about what comes next. And so they put their hope and the one who offers blessing and hope in an indescribable way. And now I want to show you scripturally what I've just said to you. In Titus, verse two, uh, chapter 2 starts in verse 11. And so the Bible says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. This is a way of saying this is what his first coming has done. Jesus' advent, his first coming, was the grace of God that brought salvation that appeared, it appeared to all men. 
And that salvation, that grace and salvation, even that alone, when you, listen, when you ask Christ into your life, it's not, it's not this thing of, okay, now I'm going to try to do better. When you ask Christ into your life, it is so supernatural. It is, uh, uh, it is so potent and powerful that the experience all by itself begins to change your life. And so it teaches us to say no to some stuff. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age. That's what his first coming stirs and does in us. But look, but look, verse 13, it splits while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us. What he's telling us is a person who is passionately in love with Jesus has this thing, this thing in their life, and this thing is that they're always expecting that he could return in any moment. We live with an expectancy, and that expectancy all by itself changes us. And so, and so this is the word of God. It is spoken. It speaks. It speaks with supernatural power. And so let's let it do that into our own lives, into our own hearts right this moment. And so watch the big idea that is flowing out of it. The big idea flowing out is this Advent, this anticipation for his coming, arrival. That's what Advent means. It means arrival or coming. Our anticipation for that. Advent calls on us to do something, and that is to live expecting the unexpected coming of Jesus. Live expecting the unexpected coming of Jesus and the, uh, the unexpected blessing and hope that it brings. And I want us to focus right there. There is this incredible contrast between his first and second coming. And it draws down for us this incredible contrast in how we live our own, how we live our lives in the here and now and what we hope for. And I want to draw that down in this message and in the next message to come. And so look at this. Here, look, here's how Jesus came. He came weak, despised, and suffering. In his first coming, he came weak, despised, and suffering, but when he comes again, he will return powerful and worshiped and conquering. And that should make a huge difference in our lives. And let me show you how. So I'm going to just draw the first, the first contrast today. There are multiple, but I'm just giving you one today, and here it is. He came first, number one, he came first in weakness. He will come again in power. Now, that, but before this message is over, if you're listening closely to it with your heart, that's going to have an impact on your life. That when he came first, he came in weakness, but when he comes again, he will come in power. Now, already you might be, you might be, you know, objecting. Wait, 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 coming in weakness, I don't like that. If Jesus is God, then he's not weak. But when Jesus came first, I want you to hear this uh, clearly and closely, he made himself weak. Here is the second person of the Godhead coming to earth. We, we would not be able to handle his presence if he did not make himself weak. In fact, Philippians 2, 7 says he made himself nothing. And so he chose. Here is God Come in flesh, he chose where to be born and all of the circumstances around it. He's the second person of the Godhead. He gets to do that. He can choose. And so he didn't choose to be born in, in the emperor's palace in Rome. He did not choose to be born in a wealthy villa in, in, in Athens or on the temple grounds in Jerusalem. He chose a peasant mother. He chose an insignificant village in which to be born in. He chose a stinking stable, cow barn, for his nursery. He chose a cold and rough feed trough for his bassinet. He came purposefully weak and humbly. And that was his whole life. 
This is not just his birth. That was his whole life. He said at one point that foxes have holes to live in. I don't even own a hut to sleep in. Hosea the prophet predicted about him that that a battered and bruised reed he would not break off, that a smoldering little wick and a clay lamp he would not even snuff out. Those are a little bit strange to us, but they were idioms of the day, and both of those were idioms of really weak and vulnerable people. If a person was just so fragile, if they were just really, they'd been beaten and battered, they would be called a, 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 a battered reed, and it, wouldn't just, it would take a whew, and it would break off. And the Bible is saying about how Jesus came, how he came the first time. He came so gently that he wouldn't harm a vulnerable person, a person at the end of the rope. A smoldering wick would mean their life is almost extinguished and he would not extinguish even someone near, near death. It just means that he came so gently and so sens sensitively. Even when Jesus even when Jesus officially proclaimed himself as Messiah, he did that in the triumphal entry when he came into Jerusalem just before he was crucified. You know, uh, it has only been just in recent times that I've realized in studying that passage that I've realized that Jesus actually organized that parade. I've never really fully got that. Jesus organized the parade for which he would declare himself Messiah. And so look at what he did. He enters Jerusalem at the head of that parade, and he entered deliberately not on a white stallion. Every conquering ruler would say, get me the tallest horse, the blackest horse, the whitest horse, and make sure it can prance, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move into that city majestically. And Jesus says, no, get me a donkey who has a colt, and I'm going to ride the colt. Weak and unimpressive. But what does that mean? What does all of that mean? Well, let's ask it. Why did Christ come in such weakness? Why? All of this is building to something very important in your life. And so why did he come with such weakness? I'm going to give you two reasons. Number one, number one, I hope you can understand this. I can't spend really any time. He did it in order to reach you, reach into you. If you had, I don't know, I'm going to, this is going to be silly. If, if you found yourself having great compassion for an ant bed and, and you see the lawnmower coming and you yelled at the ants, run, 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 run. There. They're going to be afraid of you and run, run, but they're going to run into the hole, right? But here's Jesus coming to be an ant, just like you and me, in the weakest possible form in order to reach into you and say that I love you and that I care for you and I'm bringing remedy to your life. And so he came, he came in such weakness in order to reach you. But then secondly, secondly, this is where we're going to count for a second, and that is he, he came that way in order to show you how to live. He, he lived an example. It was to show you how to live. In Matthew 11, Jesus, uh, Jesus says to the mass of humanity, it's crushing in on him at a certain moment. And there, everyone was just harassed and helpless and needy and, and, and infirm. They needed healing. And Jesus, Jesus just says, come to me, everyone who's weary and weak and burdened, and I will give you rest, for I am gentle and humble of heart. And what that turns out to be is the way he calls on you and me to live as Christ followers. It's, it's the only way to live in this world as a Christ follower. Why? Because this, it's the only way to find any meaning for this life. Accumulation has never brought any genuine meaning into any person's life. It brings fun and it brings options. It brings a bunch of temptation but I'm telling you, the world is absolutely packed full of empty millionaires. And so, even the social scientists, social scientists today will say the most meaningful lives are the lives that are given away. And here is Jesus saying, this is how 
you live. Live as a servant of Jesus and a servant of others' needs and hurts. And, and, and it is thee, this, this coming in weakness, this way to live, this way that he's showing us to live, it's the only way to be the presence of Jesus, the only way to be his presence in this world, to live like he lived in a world that needs him so much and make them thirsty for him, to live just like that. And so that's why he came in weakness, first to reach you, but then to call on you and show you how to live. And so that is what his first coming calls on you to do. It's the contrast. I said there's a contrast in his first and second coming. Uh, fully expected but missed. Unexpected but can't be missed. Uh, now, now let's move to his second coming. And that is when he returns unexpected but impossible to miss. Uh, when he comes back, he's coming back not on a donkey's colt, but he's coming back on a white stallion from the sky in infinite power and glory. And I want you to see that scripturally. And so, so consider Revelation 19. This is the definitive moment in all of history. This is the moment, Revelation 19, 11, when Jesus the second, the moment that Jesus returns. And so the Bible says, starting in verse 11, and so I saw heaven open. You're not going to miss that. You're, you're not going to be able to miss that when heaven opens. And behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. And his eyes are a flame of fire. And his, on his head are many diadems or crowns. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. And he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. There he is. It's Jesus. Verse 14. And the armies... The armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Verse 15, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that, so, so that with it he may strike down the nations, meaning the peoples who are opposed to him, who hate him, full of evil, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads in the wine presses of the fierce wrath of God uh, Almighty. Verse 16, and on, uh, and on his robe and on his thigh, there's a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What I've just described for you is second Christmas, his second coming, his second advent. It's the moment that he comes again. And it is not in weakness and humility and servanthood, but in power and in glory and conquering. In fact, if you, if you just keep going in that passage, let me just show you what the first few moments or the first few hours of his coming again looks like. And the moment that he returns, it goes on to say that the Antichrist is wiped out. The Antichrist is one world leader who, who, call, who, who calls, who pulls almost all of the world away from the things of God and loving God and knowing God. It is, it is life, it is human life minus God. That's what he builds and he promotes and he's evil to the core and he's immediately, along with the false prophet, scooped up and thrown into the lake of fire. That's the place of eternal separation from God. And then the devil, the devil, it just goes on to say, the devil himself is bound by a single angel. <laughs> the, the, Christ just sends one angel, go get the devil and throw him into the abyss. And he does it. And every evil, rebellious human heart toward God is wiped away in that moment. And then Jesus begins a thousand year reign on this earth a reign of restoration and redemption and renewing life and an absence of evil because he has wiped it out and so here's the question why, why does Christ return in such power We've answered the question, why did he come in such weakness and humility? Well, we've we figured it out. It is in order to show you how to live. But why? Why does he come then, secondly, in such power and glory and conquering? Here's the answer for a lot of reasons. <laughs> 
But I'm going to focus on just one. It's not even the primary one, but I'm, I, I want it to focus on your life. Of course, he comes primarily to wipe evil out once and for all on this earth and to restore, to restore, to, to, to restore creation to what God originally planned for it to be. But there's a very personal reason that Jesus comes in such power and glory. A very personal reason to you. If you're a Christ follower, this is for you. And so, so the way to answer this, what is, it a, what is it in me that he's doing? Let's just ask it this way. Where are followers of Jesus in that moment? It's a good question. Where are followers of Jesus the moment that he returns? It's in the passage. So I just read to you Revelation 19, those few verses. Right in the middle of it is verse 14. And... and and there's a group of people you probably didn't recognize, but it turns out to be you. Verse 14, And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. It turns out, and we don't have time, you know, to like tease all this out, but it turns out two chapters before, those people are identified. They're clearly identified in chapter 17, and they are, they are the resurrected, glorified, rewarded saints who were raptured earlier. That's you. You may be scared of horses now, but you're going to be riding a white one <laughs> when he returns. That means as a Christ follower, you will return with him. When he comes again, and then, and then, the passage goes on. Uh, I'm, I'm just summarizing for you. And so the passage go, goes on and says this additional thing. Here's the reason. Here's why he comes. One of the reasons that he comes in such power, uh, Revelation 20, verse 6, it says there that you are blessed, you as Christ followers are blessed because you will reign with him for a thousand years. He comes back in such power and glory in order for you following him to reign with with him on this earth for a thousand years. It's a con yes, you should. We don't know if we want that or not. We, we, no, no. I want Jesus to, uh, to come again, but maybe not today, right? Is that, is that what it is? And so repeating, why does Christ return in power? The answer is for you to reign with him in his kingdom. This is what he wants for you. So look at the contrast of your life. This, this contrast has got to be true for your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, your, it means this, your life right now matters so much. Because what you are doing now has, has incredible meaning and impact for the life to come for you. The Bible says that all believers will stand before Christ in a rewards judgment. And I want you to absorb that. You, as a follower of Jesus, you will stand before Christ in a rewards judgment. And what will be judged? I can say it in one, one word. Your faithfulness. That's what's judged your faithfulness to just simply obey him, to live a life that loves him and that obeys him. Your faithfulness to give and serve and offer your life. Your faithfulness to sacrifice your own selfishness, self-centeredness in order to give your life away to the purposes of God. Your faithfulness has an impact on the reward and the responsibility given to you when Christ returns. It matters so much. And so in all of Jesus' parables about his return, they're, they're all about being ready. And when you read what it means to be ready, it always means being fully faithful with what he has given you in this life. Ready means faithfulness. So um, I'll give you an example. So when Jesus tells the teaching story of the three stewards, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, he's telling you, he's, th that story is, is about this. It matters so much how you live your life right now. 
So, you know, uh, and you may be familiar, the story goes that a rich man is in need of going on a long, extended trip, and so he he pulls together some of his wealth. It's a significant amount of his wealth. And it says in the passage, he handed it over to these three stewards. These servants were given great responsibility. And so it was given to them in, in a, a weight measurement, a weight measurement called talents. So some sort of precious metal was given to them, gold or silver, in the weight of a talent. A lot of sort of uh, theological discussion about how much a talent is, but, but it could be, it could be, one of the answers is that a single talent uh, of silver could be worth 480 thousand dollars in today's dollars 480 a single talent so the least talented of the talent guys he gets a half a million dollars of the master's money the 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 two talent servant guy he is nearly a he gets nearly a million dollars to to invest the five talent guy gets almost two and a half million dollars it's clear the servants in this story is you and me. It's you and me. And the point is that what God has placed in you is not insignificant. That what God has placed in you is of high value to him. What he has put in you is incredibly valuable to him. And what he has, this is what else you've got to draw down from, and what he has put in you is also not yours. It's God's. Everything in your life, everything you have, everything you are, everything you touch, it's given to you as a responsibility from God. That's the point of the story. And so when the master returns, the story says two of them were faithful. They were faithful. How do we know? The master says, well done, good, and faithful uh, steward they apparently both doubled the value of what the master had put into their life and the master says well done good and faithful you and and and, and here here's the point of his second coming listen to these words from Jesus in this story well done good and faithful servant you've been faithful in a little now I will put you in charge of much I'm preparing you in this life to reign with me. And I will judge your worthiness to reign, your ability to reign, and how faithful you are with what I give you in this life and how faithful you are to it. And so it's a reference to the moment that Christ returns. Turns out one of them was unfaithful. Jesus calls him that. But, it, but he, he was unfaithful, but, but I don't understand. He was unfaithful. He didn't, he didn't steal the talent, brought it back to the master. He didn't squander it. He didn't come back and say, I've only got half of it because I didn't really choose well. It's just that he didn't use it. He didn't do anything with it. And Jesus calls that guy wicked. And then he takes away. There's more instruction. He takes away the one talent given to him. He gives it to the five-talent guy. And Jesus is making something really clear there that is kind of jaw-dropping. Not every follower, follower of Jesus will actually reign with him. Only the faithful ones. And faithfulness, faithfulness equals expectancy. Only those servants, only those who are servants in this life, faithful to use what God has given to serve, to offer themselves fully to the purposes of God. And it culminates here. This whole message is this statement. Waiting on the return of Christ is about living your life faithfully every day, every moment. 
It's about giving yourself away. It's about just wanting to live in an obedient and pleasing way to him. It's about how you care for every person that God has put in your life. It's how you care for them. It's about how you serve in the body of Christ. It's about how you love every person in your life, especially the unlovable ones. It's about, it's about your generosity, especially toward the purposes of God. Waiting on Christ is about serving him, waiting to reign with him when he comes again. Your life is a contrast. Just as the coming of Jesus is a contrast, your life is a contrast. You serve, you serve, uh, you live as servants here in this moment in order to reign with him in the life to come. We've got to draw the line right there. Could we bow? I want to call your hearts to the influence, the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place in this moment. I know he's here. I know he's all around us. And he speaks. And he's speaking in your heart, your conscience right now. And for some in this place, in this moment, you've sort of treated faith in Christ lightly or you put it at arm's distance. You don't really like the fact that somebody else could be in charge of your life, but this morning you see the power of embracing Christ. Let me just tell you, it's, you know, it's not just a folk song. You're, you're serving somebody. It doesn't matter who you are and what you say, your philosophy or theology is you're serving something. It's just the way the human heart is made. And I call on you to turn your heart to Christ, to ask him into your life, to ask for what he's done on the cross to count for you. How do you do that? You can, you can do it now by praying. And I, I would encourage you to do that right now. While we're praying, just pray something like, Dear God, I know what I've said is I don't know what I think or what I believe, but I think it's important that I turn my life to you. Because I want to be ready when you come again. I want to be in your presence. I want to live in the blessed hope of that. So I ask you please to forgive me of all of my sin. Pray that. And to come into my life. I ask that what you did on the cross to count for me. Pray that. And I turn away from all the substitutes and I turn to you to be the leader of my life. Pray that. Please come into my life. Please make me brand new. I want you to know that if you've just prayed that, Christ has come in. He keeps his promise that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you've asked him genuinely, he's come into your life. You've placed your faith in him. There are Christ followers in this room who you know that if you were to be named among the servants, it would not be the servant you want to be. And, and, and the way you move to be the faithful servant is this, surrender. Not my agenda, not my pursuits, not what I'm going after, but you, God. What you want in my life and a complete pursuit of you. Pray that. Dear God, I just thank you that you've been in this place. And God, I thank you that your presence is so apparent. And God, I pray that you're just doing something so powerful and supernatural in our lives right now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.